Today we're going to change tack a little bit from the talks that you've just heard, um, which were mainly focusing on business engagement, um, and we're going to focus instead on issues around open science and its relationship to international collaboration. Um, there is a kind of connection here. Um, we feel that obviously that it's important when building business engagement activities and general collaborations, open science practices, there's quite a lot of evidence that suggests that it's very helpful in building those connections. Um, so I think there is a, a link. Um, so I'll just run through what we're going to talk about. We won't take up too much time, maybe 15 minutes or so. Um, and what we want to touch upon, first of all, is the UK open access policy context as essentially a kind of good case study to talk about open science, about the policies and mandates around it, and about uh, how researchers are simultaneously undertaking kind of broader research collaborations and how these policies fit or maybe even hinder those kind of collaborations. Um, we'll then also go on to talk a little bit about some of our views on um, open access and open science and um, issues around compliance and how these policies are being implemented on the ground uh, and use some of our research as part of a wider project which we, where we looked into research publication data and whether institutional systems were actually kind of given a true picture of the scale of international collaboration. Um, and then we'll finish with a discussion which will continue this, this talk about the policy context, I think, and um, inform you of some of the other views that are out there about, this, uh, about open science and open access and particularly the policies around it. So the first thing to mention then is, um, does, does everyone, is everyone quite aware of open access, open science? Um, is anyone not, has no understanding of this? If you don't have any understanding, please just raise your hand now. Okay, good, that's good. Um, so um, you'll probably know about the two routes to open access then, the two routes being the gold and the green route. So the green route is whereby an academic would be accepted um, for publication in a journal and they would then um, use their accepted manuscript and they'd place it onto an institutional repository. The one we have here at Brunel is called Bura. Uh, this is free of charge, but it may be subject to publisher embargoes. Um, and then the other route is the gold route to open access, which is where an academic does the same thing, submits to a journal, but then um, they, rather than put the accepted manuscript onto an institutional repository, they will pay what's called an article processing charge for that to be made, the final published version, the nice lovely typeset version, to be available on a publisher website. Um, so in the UK, this is why I want to use the UK um, as a kind of good example, um, in the UK we have an interesting policy context. So in tw 2012, um, the government commissioned report, the Finch report, um, recommended support for the gold route to open access. Um, then as a result, the research councils took up this kind of uh, recommendation and strongly prefer gold for those who receive funding from them. Um, and similarly, medical charities such as the Wellcome Trust also mandate for gold open access. Now, interestingly, at the same time, Research England, who uh, were formerly called HEFGE, who administer the research excellence framework in this country, um, have recommended, well, no, they have mandated, sorry, that green open access is what researchers have to do for their, their accepted manuscripts to be compliant for the next REF. So it's an interesting policy context, because on the one hand, you have some fund, some, even some government organisations recommending gold, and then at the same time, other sections of the government recommending green. So it's kind of quite confused and sometimes contradictory. And the thing we've kind of thought about is whether this is maybe hindering broader engagement with open science and actually making academics see open science as something that is to do with compliance rather than as a kind of cultural shift. So just to put this in a broader context, a, a global context, um, this is a chart from um, RawMap, um, which highlights from 2005 up to 2015 the exponential rise of open access policies and mandates by institutions, by national bodies and international policies as well. As you can see, that in many ways this is great. You know, we've seen a massive increase in um, institutions really taking open access seriously and mandating for open access. But at the same time, the question remains as to, well, is this also creating a cultural shift in that academics are being more open, are engaging with open practices more, or are they seeing open science and open access as simply something to do with compliance? 
which David is going to talk about further in a moment. And just before I pass over to David, the thing I wanted to also mention is a recent report by Research England. You'll remember they're the ones who administer the REF, um, so they recommend green open access as the way to go. Um, they found in a recent report that over 80% of the outputs covered in their policy, so over the last sort of three year, two or three years or so, um, were met their requirements or had registered an exception of some sort. And they, they said that this is an enormous achievement, which of course it is, um, in that we are seeing 80% um, of recent publications moving towards openness in some way. And this shouldn't be underplayed, and we are kind of, from the research we've done, we're quite supportive of this, but at the same time, we kind of wonder where this policy goes. What's the end point of it? Is it just kind of going to be a statistical measure and say, oh, great, 80% of publications in the UK are open access? Or is it going to also be followed up by a kind of desire to shift the way research is done? And that's the, the question we, we want to ask. And so I'll pass over to David. In our research, um, so we likened uh, what, what our findings really to the metaphor of the telescope where we were sort of looking outward from our institution to the collaborative research environment. So for institutions, the perspective on the policy environment does become a bit like looking through a telescope the wrong way around. We have to focus narrowly on our individual institutions and our own compliance levels, rather than on the bigger picture of emerging cultures of open practice at a global scale. So typically institutions necessarily have to use local systems and services to meet these compliance targets. But within a collaborative research environment, we ask the question whether this focus is too narrow. Are we incentivising a genuine cultural transition to open access and open science? So as part of our study, we explored the host locations of a sample of Brunel publications to see if they appeared in the repository systems of collaborating research organisations. So the data here shows data from repository hosts that we found via the core service, that's a popular acronym. Um, the data includes coordinates specifying the physical location of, um, of the repository and the research output. So in our results, we've found at, at least 370 distinct works replicated in multiple OA locations. And uh, we think this is quite interesting uh, yeah, and revealing when placed in that wider policy context. And this data gives us a general idea of the scale of international collaborations. So the highest concentrations were found within European territories, but we also found papers in the US, Australia, China, and many other territories. So the fact that these individual publications are appearing in these different locations may highlight a possible duplication of effort being caused by the po policy landscape and being enforced at a local level by institutions. Outputs only need, to be open, only need to be made open access once. So institutions are particularly sensitive to the ramifications of non-compliance, for example, in terms of access to future funding, and most now implement compliance through these local systems, which they have the best control and visibility of. So the data may simultaneously demonstrate how the implementation of OA policies um, at a local level are contributing to this duplication of effort. There's also somewhat of a, a, a broader argument here about the contradictions um, in increasing drives for international collaboration, which is of course enacted by researcher activity and you know, the antithesis of, of local policies and, and mandates. So these zoom in on institutional compliance rather than looking outward to the collaborative picture that's, that's being driven by natural research collaboration. So this is one example of, um, of a Brunel paper uh, with, with many, uh, many co-authors. Um, so the Brunel author is Professor Christina Victor, and the co-authors uh, come from a range of UK universities as well as some specialist research institutes and one international colleague from Australia. So according to Google Scholar, this paper can be found in nine different open access locations, including institutional repositories, Europe PubMed Central, um, from the publisher website itself, uh, OA aggregators and social uh, networking uh, sites such as ResearchGate. So in some ways this is really positive as it demonstrates you know, a broad engagement with open dissemination but it also shows you know, a scale of duplication um, which suggests that you know, after doing some excellent international research collaboration researchers are invariably retreating into meeting these institutional or nationally managed policies for open access dissemination. 
So this may be leading to quite an inefficient process overall. Uh, as, you know, as, as I've said, open access only needs to happen once. Um, but it also maybe contributes to this growing feeling, in the UK at least, that OA is becoming merely a compliance exercise. So the results by Research England are certainly positive, um, but the results are not examining the effects nor the perverse incentives of various institutional implementations of these policies. Is this policy landscape incentivising a genuine cultural transition to open access and open science? So open access is not supposed to be an end in and of itself. Um, there's a global and international picture that intersects with individual institutions and ac academics. And of course, there's a much bigger framework that's emerging to support the modern research environment, commonly referred to as open science. And this area is, of course, being championed by the EU. You know, open science includes many initiatives such as open peer review, open data, open education. And within this, the open access to the research outputs is just one component. So where's the reward for these wider international and collaborative engagements with open science practices? Yeah, this landscape requires incentives to promote a culture of, um, of research and educational openness. In the UK, at least, our success is currently being measured in rather simple statistical terms. What's lacking is an incentive for cultural change to open access on a journey towards open science and the new age of modern research practice and communication. So we'll just close the talk by some thoughts from leaders in the open access and open science movements. Um, so Dr Elizabeth Gadd says that, in her opinion, we, we've rushed too quickly in with policy demands instead of providing the mechanisms by which academic communities could form their own flavour of openness. At that point, openness lost the opportunity to become a cultural norm because it had then become a compliance issue. Danny Kingsley says that compliance with a policy is not the end goal of a policy in itself. What we are not measuring or indeed even discussing is the reasons why we're doing this. And Cameron, May Cameron Nalen uh, describes open access as taking books from the library and tossing them over a wall. The challenge lies in breaking down walls both between institutions uh, but also out to those wider publics and, and, society, and society at large. Ultimately, we hope that researcher engagement can be fully recognised and so help bring about a cultural and technical transformation in science communications to realise the promised benefits for research and wider society. And that's the end. Thank you very much.